Hey, how goes it? So you're listening to Vaughn Fry on the recently canceled podcast with me as never. Actually, last time I kind of had a guest. Nobody because nobody loves me. Anyways, uh, we've got, or I do, have three topics for you. The first two are available to everybody up on the YouTubes. The third is a Patreon supporter exclusive, so for $1 a month, you can get full access to the recently canceled podcast and tell none of your friends. So first of all, I'm going to talk about the WWE and what I would do different and kind of what uh, I think is failing right now for them. Then I want to talk about PUBG Mobile. And for the third topic, how I would have saved Toys R Us. So we're on the eve of WrestleMania. I don't remember the number. It's 2018. So yeah, whatever. Um, I know of wrestling right now in the sense that I applied for a job as like a comedy writer. It, it was brought to my attention and billed as Monday Night Raw being the last great variety show or the last great American variety show, and I kind of thought, you know what, there there could be something for me to add here, and so since I didn't even get a damn interview, I thought I would kind of give you some of my ideas here, and uh, how that stuff kind of went down. This was about a year ago or so. Um, I've seen some wrestling kind of it to prepare for, uh, you know, the interview process in the event that, you know, someone would ever give a uh, non-Jewish guy from Kansas a chance to right uh, for TV, and first of all, I would note, Asuka, who, by, why is her name not pronounced Asuka? This could very well, it definitely the most overrated female wrestler, diva, whatever we want to call them, we don't call them wrestlers anymore, we, we call them superstars, right? She's overrated AF. I mean, this gal... When she has this massive winning streak, it like exceeds Goldberg's winning streak. Now, Goldberg would actually go out there and look like he's beating somebody up. She has some kind of haphazard turnaround heel kick. It's not sweet chin music. It's sour. It's it's like sour jazz music. Muzak. Elevator music. And that'll like knock a gal out. She has... A limited aerial repertoire. She just kind of barely speaks English, but gets on the mic and says, no one's ready for Asuka. And then everybody goes nuts. Who are these people entertained by this? Is is wrestling now, like, is it only for kids? Like, they've moved away from the attitude. In the 90s, I thought that the attitude was pretty extreme over at WWF. I was more watching WCW. Um, I, I was watching uh, Goldberg wreck people. I was watching the NWO stuff, and Monday Night Nitro um, for WCW always seemed to have like a pay per view matchup promised at the end. It would be like tonight Hulk Hogan and so and so. Like at one point, it's like Hogan and and Hart team up. Uh, against Sting and, and the Warrior, because they didn't want to call him Ultimate Warrior. I think it was a Nitro. These events, it would always be like, wow, this is like some kind of dream match. And then it would end with some kind of, uh, oh, they're brawling, it's a disqualification. All right, see you guys next time. Like, what? We're not going to watch the end of the fight? Oh, hey, Sting's flying in. He's hitting guys with bats. And uh, see you guys next time. And that's the way it would go. And I guess at WWE, at least they would deliver. They wouldn't cut away from it like that. You know, there would be a finish. But but with their situation, they were constantly propping up the pay-per-views. And that's what they're doing now. Monday Night Raw is three hours of talking about what they're going to do at pay-per-view. Or what just happened at the previous night's pay-per-view. Last night at SummerSlam, you may have thought you beat me, but I'm calling you out. Alright, let's get out there and let's point to the WrestleMania sign. And that means I'm challenging you there. 
That's all it is. If there is wrestling, it is near jobber undercard type guys not getting a push who are out there wrestling. That's about what goes down. I don't like the split brand thing. I don't like that we have a universal champion and then we have a WWE champion. What does that mean? Uh, it was bad enough when it was a WWE champion and a heavyweight champion. What? Why is there even an intercontinental champion? I don't. Is that around anymore? I, maybe that gets dissolved. I, you know what? I think that's they brought that back. How can one be intercontinental but not be the world champion? Like I could kind of see a, an American or a TV champion or a European champion. The Universal Champion sounds greater than WWE. So then you have like these, oh, well, this belt is on the SmackDown brand. This one's on the Raw brand. I don't see why they need to be brands. Why not just have the talent float between the different programs? You don't need one of them to look like JV. Like, does anybody watch SmackDown? Don't you end up with a problem here? Where it's like, well, what good does that belt constitute? You know, without WCW to give WWE a ratings go, they have no reason to bring back the attitude to make this palatable to anybody with more mature sense. You know, looking back at old clips, the godsend that was Stone Cold Steve Austin and what he did for the company was everything. WCW had all of these guys on their roster, but they were smaller. They... They weren't as big in names as Hogan. And then WCW got rid of all of these guys who had become the guys over at WWE, except save for The Rock. He was like always WWE because his he had family. He was part of the lineage there. He was like, what, a second generation, second or third generation? Well, he, he had a grandfather and dad that were in uh, WWF, WWF, whatever. Like Stone Cold, he was at WCW. JR, announcer, he was with WCW. Mankind, WCW. Big time names. I, th You know what? I think Triple H may have been also at one point. Um, I think Kevin Nash was a long time ago. Then he came to WWF, was Diesel, then went to WCW, back and forth, whatever. WCW wanted the names from... WWF. They ended up getting all of them. Like anybody you saw as a kid ended up with WCW. But all those little guys, the smaller names like Jericho, whoever, they got over to WWE. I'm going to try to call it WWE here. And they became bigger. They gestated. They grew their talent. Whereas WCW just wanted to buy the talent. There's a difference there in video games, too. Nintendo cultivates and buys, well, cultivates and grows their, their brand, their characters, their games. Microsoft buys the company that makes the game, and now, there we go, we have that game. Who's really the game company here, right? Well, with WWE, you had the awesome attitude era, the, the flipping people off, the drinking the beer... It was so rowdy, and it, at times it really pushed the envelope, and it just seemed kind of like the naughtier thing. It was like MTV. You're like, oh, you don't want your parents catching you watching WWF, My Night Raw. That's a little racy. And better play it safe with Nitro or something, right? But the Nitro thing ran out of gas because, you know, eventually everybody has to join the NWO, and um, Goldberg getting cheated out of his streak. There loses some mystique there. I like the way how Goldberg was quiet. He was a quiet superstar. He didn't talk. I think all he would say is, who's next? Give a yell at the camera. He'd walk into the ring like Mike Tyson. And that was really cool. There was a, a, a thing to it, a mystique. But on the flip side, you had Stone Cold, who was able to work the mic so well that now people are still doing his things. They're still saying what? I think they're holding Austin 316 signs when he's not in the building. You know, that sort of stuff has longer lasting appeal. 
And, you know, not to necessarily throw Dwayne Johnson under the bus over his wrestling credentials, but he was not as good on the mic as Stone Cold. He was not as good at selling moves as Stone Cold. He'd oversell like Ric Flair. But you know what? They would deliver at pay-per-view. You know, you're watching these old matches. Mankind puts it on the line, falling off that steel cage, getting thrown off by Undertaker, and climbing back up for some more, only to go through the ceiling. I guess there has to be a fine line between hyping up that night's event on the cable network and hyping up and actually delivering on the pay-per-view. So at the pay-per-view, you have the delivery, but do I want to watch the three-hour hype up? No. That's the problem. You don't need three hours of hyping up. So what's going to... Getting back onto the Asuka train here. She's got this undefeated streak. How is that going to get snapped? Well, I can tell you, Ronda Rousey. What else would Ronda be there for other than to snap Asuka's streak? Oh, I'm sorry, Asuka's streak. That's the whole point. There ain't no way Ronda doesn't do that. I don't who whoever she's fighting at WrestleMania, I don't care. It was it Stephanie McMahon or something. You know they got to build R- Ronda up. She was undefeated for so long in the UFC. Oh, this is a big get for us, a legitimate mixed martial artist. We're not going to have her lose to Asuka. Clearly, this is the person inheriting the Asuka throne. I the it's so blatantly obvious. I you know why bother scripting uh, the results? You know why should, if, if everybody can see it coming even before it's booked? I would also like to see a superstar, like the next big superstar, a guy who is capable of doing any finishing move, yet he has no finisher. What he would do is he would defeat his opponent with his opponent's finisher. So, for example, you defeat The Undertaker, Tombstone The Undertaker. You know, you put the stunner on Stone Cold. You give the F5 to Brock Lesnar. It would be the ultimate insult to defeat your opponent with their finisher. I think that would be really cool. I'd also like to see the return of the quiet superstar. You know, maybe I like how Brock has Paul Heyman up there talking for him, but I don't necessarily like the my client Brock Lesnar. It's like we know. Yeah, uh, we've heard you're standing there. We got it. I like the the list of Jericho thing. Like some of these little uh, comedy sketch things can really go over nicely. And then you, hell, you can even sell the uh, the notepad, the list of Jericho online and all. But couldn't there be a guy who he just gets announced and he goes out there and he takes care of shit? You know, do why do these guys need to be talking so much? Like in real sports, you never see any athlete kill it on the mic. They talked to LeBron James after a game, and with his barely graduated high school IQ, he's not putting forth great shit. He's telling kids, hey, make sure you stay in school unlike me. Oh, and guns are bad. Vote for Hillary Clinton. You know, what good is that? Like, real athletes? Hell, you ever watch First Take on ESPN? They used to actually have a heavy part of that was interviews with athletes. And it bombed. It was awful. They would then cut to the arguing between Skip and Stephen A. Or Woody Page at one point. They would. Everybody wanted to watch that. They, they'd go and do like a little saddle interview. And it'd be like Dana Jacobson. So tell us about the first time you, you uh, made a touchdown catch. Well, uh, you know, I, I ran in practice and uh, caught the ball. Yeah. It was oh, it's dreadful listening to athletes, and these guys are not that most, not the most convincing of actors. I would also like to see a jobber with a massive win streak, a guy who would go out there, get beat for uh, eight to ten minutes, and then somehow accidentally win. Like um, 
you know, maybe maybe he's giving it his all. Uh, he doesn't necessarily put a move on a guy, but something accidental would happen to a dude that would knock him out, and then this guy wins. Or maybe they both get knocked out, and then someone throws the jobber onto him and then wakes up the ref. Oh, hey, look, he's covering him. And this jobber, when he'd do his... Uh, his promos, he'd be like, well, I went out there, I gave it 110%, and I'm just glad to be here. You know, he'd talk like an actual athlete. So, um, next, I want to talk about PUBG Mobile. I gave it a play, saw that up on the YouTube. Uh, I don't know if I really want to play that anymore. I don't have a controller that would work with it. I don't think I do. Um... I don't think I have the capabilities. I don't want to have to hold or cradle an iPhone that's four inches to have to do this. I The limited communication, there, there's not really like any chatter, talk. Like At least Fortnite on Xbox, I can talk to people. Be like, hey, we need to do this strategy. We need to go to this area. No, nah, nothing here. I don't like playing online competitive type games, even though this is less than competitive where I require other people to work with me, and they're usually five-year-old pro Genjis, off doing their own thing, don't give a shit like I do, people throwing matches, all these modern games just make you yearn for the 16-bit glory days, where it's you, whatever friend you had, or the computer. You know, when you lost in those games, it was you losing. Be it your friend beating your ass in Street Fighter or a cheap M. Bison controlled by the computer. There was satisfaction knowing that you could have won if you were better. There was satisfaction winning. Now I just feel like you're screwed. You know? If, if that asshole kid on your team wants you to lose, you're going to lose and there's nothing you can do about it, so why are you bother playing? With PUBG Mobile, maybe the lack of talk gives people less reason to be a dick. Like, uh, oh, hey, I never got to learn that guy. I don't, I don't hate him. I guess I'm not going to throw the game. Is that the idea? I, I, I don't really want mobile gaming to take off on phones in this way. I feel like to, to get the full dedicated experience, you need to be at a stationed area that has all this equipment. Um, I, at some point, it, it felt like eventually everybody's going to be playing like first-person shooter like Halo on their phone in some, some way. This would, would be the commonplace thing. We're not going to have the TVs or the consoles. The, the games are only going to be on the phone, right? That's where the developers are going. That's where the big money seems to be, especially when you can give the game away for free and then charge people money to buy a shirt and tie in it, right? With that sort of stuff in mind you start to see that it's not much of a fun experience. Like in, in many ways, and I coined the phrase, you're free to play, pay to win. This, it doesn't look like a pay to win thing, though what if you could jump out of that carrier with your parachute and you already have a gun, you know, and, and missiles or whatever. If Once you start giving people that kind of incentive, yeah, you can make money doing that. But I hate it. You know, I I don't really see myself putting a lot of time into a mobile game, even even if it got me a few YouTube views here and there, honestly. It, it's not something I really see myself doing. So that does it for the recently canceled podcast. Uh, this is episode five, but nope, not quite yet. This is it for YouTube. If you are a Patreon listener or you want to hear the last topic, How I Would Have Saved Toys R Us... Now click over on my Patreon, donate $1 a month, and you'll hear the rest.